Microplastics have been getting a ton of attention lately because of a landmark study that was published this year linking microplastic intake to heart disease. However, there were also a couple of other studies that were published this year that do suggest that microplastic intake is far more common than we originally thought. And so uh, because of this and because it's so difficult to find good and reliable information on microplastics, I figured I would do an entire video on the topic, what they are, how they affect the human body as well as some practical ways to avoid consuming them. So uh, let's go ahead and dive in. I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story and I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. Now, one of the major issues with microplastics is that most people far underestimate how ubiquitous the uh, exposure risk to microplastics actually is. In 2018, a study was published that found that the average bottle of water contained roughly 325 pieces of microplastic. And at the time, this was cause for concern and started getting a lot of attention in the media and on social media and even prompted the uh, World Health Organization to start an investigation on the presence of microplastics in various uh, food sources and water sources. However, just this year, another study has been published on the amount of plastic in the average bottle of water. And because uh, detection methods have become so much more sophisticated than they were j just a few years ago, this study in particular found that the average bottle of water contained over 240,000 pieces of plastic. Now, the NIH website on this topic notes that, quote, the researchers found that on average, a liter of bottled water included about 240,000 tiny pieces of plastic. About 90% of these plastic fragments were nanoplastics. This total was 10 to 100 times more plastic particles than seen in earlier studies, which mostly focused on larger microplastics. The water contained particles of all seven types of plastics. The most common was polyamine, a type of nylon that's often used to help filter and purify water. An abundance of polyethylene tetraphthalate was also detected, and this might be expected since PET is used to make bottles for water, soda, and many other drinks and foods. Other identified plastics included polyvinyl chloride, polymethyl methacrylate, and polystyrene, which is also used in water purification. Now, it's not exactly clear whether or not these uh, plastic particles are showing up in the water supply uh, because of the actual filters that are being used to filter the water, or if it's because of the inability of the filters to filter out these particles. But what is clear is that these particles are far more ubiquitous and present in the water supply than we originally thought. And on top of that are not just showing up in the water supply, but are also showing up in the food supply as well. For decades now, research has been ongoing into the presence of plastics in various food uh, sources and water sources. And a lot of this research has specifically specifically focused on the presence of microplastics and plastics in general in things like seafood and uh, sea salt as well as packaged and processed foods. And the reason for this is somewhat obvious. These are some of the foods that are most at risk for possible plastic contamination ever since some of the research that came out uh, back in the 70s as well as the discovery of the Great Pacific uh, Garbage Patch back in 1997. Scientists have been keenly aware of the possibility of plastics making it into the food supply via uh, ocean foods and, and products that come from the ocean, um, as well as being keenly aware of the possibility of the actual plastic packaging making it into the foods. And so this has been somewhat of a concern for a long time now. However, with even more recent research coming out again this year, it also appears that a lot of these plastics are not just showing up in seafoods, but also in produce and meat that's coming from inland sources as well. However, the scary thing about this conversation is that there's just so much that we don't even understand yet. Where are these plastic particles even coming from? What do they consist of? How much of them are getting into the food supply? What type of harm does this do to the human body? How do we prevent this from happening in the future? However, what little we do know, um, I do want to cover in the rest of this video, starting with simply what microplastics are.
Now, as we'll talk about here in a minute, one of the best ways to uh, reduce your microplastic exposure is to actually filter your drinking water. However, uh, the reverse osmosis process is notorious for also stripping some of the electrolytes from water, which is why today's video is sponsored by Element Electrolyte Drink Mix. Now, in the nutrition community, we always like to talk about the, the benefits of the essential nutrients, the essential vitamins and minerals. However, what often gets left out of this conversation is the uh, absolute essential nature of the electrolytes, including sodium. Yes, sodium is super important for overall performance, physical performance, but it's also extremely fundamental to overall health. Now, what I personally like about Element is that not only is it an optimally formulated blend of the electrolytes of sodium, potassium, and magnesium with a hefty dose of sodium for the performance edge, but they've also figured out how to nail the flavor profile without using any of the garbage um, artificial sweeteners and flavors that a lot of other companies are using. Now, Element is currently offering you guys a free sample pack with any order. And so if you're interested in a super simple way to uh, improve your performance on a daily basis, make sure to check out uh, the link down below or go to drinkelement.com slash nutrition library to snag this offer. Now, when it comes to microplastics in the most literal sense, microplastics are simply plastic fibers or particles that are less than five millimeters in diameter. But then there's also nanoplastics that are kind of like an emerging topic that not a lot of folks are talking about quite yet. However, this will be a major part of the discussion moving forward. And it's worth mentioning that nanoparticles are even smaller than microplastics uh, in that they are uh, less than a hundred nanometers in diameter. And also also explains why up until this point it has been extremely difficult to identify them. Now these micro and nanoplastic particles can be composed of any one of dozens and dozens of uh, types of plastics. However, for the sake of simplicity and for the sake of recycling, these uh, plastics can typically be uh, uh, categorized into seven primary types of plastic. However, even beyond those seven types of primary plastic, there's also dozens and dozens and dozens more types of plastics that are able to make it into the food and water supply in the form of micro and nanoplastics. And then on top of the fact that there are dozens and dozens of types of plastics that are becoming microparticles and nanoparticles and making it into the food and water supply, there's also a handful of chemicals that have been known to leach directly from plastics into water water and food depending on the context. Now the reason I bring up the composition of microplastics and nanoplastics is because there are literally thousands and thousands of plastics and plastic derivatives that are in the environment that we're coming into contact with on a daily basis and the truth of the matter is that it is embarrassing how little we know and understand about the possible toxicity of these compounds. Rigorous safety testing has been performed on a handful of these compounds. However, because of the vast quantity of them, that it's just impossible to rigorously test all of these types of plastics. And even the ones that we have tested, almost all of them have shown some level of toxicity. They appear to disrupt hormone function, cause cancer, cause neurological damage, lung damage, and according to the most recent research, also possibly contribute to heart disease. Now, I wish I could go into a comprehensive breakdown of all of these plastics and how they specifically interact with the body and how they interfere with health and bind to specific receptors and interfere with DNA replication. However, this is literally impossible because of the sheer number of different types of plastics that exist. Sure, we have a little bit of comprehensive data on a very few handful of these types of plastics, but by and large, we know absolutely nothing about these plastics. And because of this, it's usually in a practical sense, more practical to assume that almost all of them are toxic to one degree or another. Sure, some of them might be safer in certain contexts than other, but the reality is, is that we simply don't know. There is a massive black hole of information 
surrounding most of these plastics. And in that type of scenario, it's usually best to um, assume the worst about most of these. Now, another reason to assume the worst about most plastics and to avoid most plastic is because it's so hard to control for the use of plastic. A certain plastic might be uh, that's toxic to consume might be used in clothing, for instance, under the assumption that no one's going to eat clothing. However, that same plastic through secondary mechanisms can enter into the environment and then enter into the food supply and then cause toxicity secondarily to its primary use case. And on this point, there's actually some interesting research recently that has demonstrated that this is actually what is happening. For instance, this study that was published just this year found that the microplastics that were found in not just seafoods, but also inland sources of meat and produce were not microplastic particles, but microplastic fibers that originated from clothing. Yes, you heard that right. Plastic fibers from clothing in meat. And now the reason I bring this up is that you wouldn't typically expect to find microplastic fibers from clothing in meat. However, this is not one of the original risk assessments that polyester and nylon went through when they were originally being approved for their use in clothing. However, these fibers are making it into the environment and then making it into the food supply, which does bring up a fantastic question, which which is how the heck is this actually happening? Now, the interesting thing here is that this is happening through several different mechanisms that are fairly disturbing if you ask me, but one is that when you wash your nylon and polyester uh, clothing, that water, that wastewater goes to water treatment facilities and uh, water treatment facilities are extremely inept and incapable of filtering out those micro particles from the water before they dispel it back into the environment and then that water is what's being used to water our food crops, water uh, the animals that we are consuming, as well as water us as individuals. And because of this, those microparticles are getting into the water supply on a mass scale and then entering into the food supply secondarily. And then the second way that this is happening is that the same water treatment facilities um, that are filtering our water, the uh, nylon and polyester microfiber that they are able to filter out uh, are being compacted in, into what's called biosolids, which is just simply human sewage sludge that is then being sold to various companies that are then using that biosolid, that human sewage, to then fertilize the land that they are growing our crops and uh, feeding our, our meat on, which is, again, extremely disturbing, but is another way that the these uh, polyester and nylon microfibers are then getting into the environment, getting into our food and water supply, and eventually getting into us. And then the third way that these microfibers make it into the environment and eventually into the water and food supply is through um, just throwing away polyester and nylon clothing. When you throw them away, they go to the landfill, and landfills are not perfect at keeping containment um, from the environment. And so uh, when they are overrun with just massive loads of not just macroplastics, but also microplastics from clothing, it's impossible to keep these from leaching into the environment. And then the fourth way is also alarming, and that is through the air. Do a quick experiment for me. Don't dust your home for over a month and then examine the dust that settles in your house. What you'll find is that over 50%, and this has been found in studies, that over 50% of the dust that is found in your home is literally microplastic fibers. And so you're also breathing in the microplastics in your home. And so there are several different mechanisms uh, by which these fibers, these microplastic fibers can enter uh, into the environment and um, pretty much all of them are somewhat alarming. Now, I know this is all pretty discouraging to find out that pretty much all of the food and water that you could probably be consuming is completely contaminated with microparticles of plastic that are 
typically coming from actually your clothing. Um, however, I do want to finish off this video by talking about some very specific ways to at least limit your exposure to some of these microplastics. Now, it's probably impossible to completely eliminate your exposure to microplastics just because of the ubiquitous nature of their presence in the environment, um, as well as the fact that they literally don't break down. Like they're going to be here for forever. However, there are a few things that you can do to limit your exposure. And the first thing you can do is to simply buy local produce and meat. Now, because of the ubiquitous nature of most of these plastics, it's going to be pretty hard to completely eliminate uh, the intake of microplastics. However, by finding local produce and meat uh, that are not utilizing biosolids, that are using some sort of water source that is uncontaminated, they're not using uh, plastic to ship uh, their, their produce, which is a big one, or using any processing methods that introduce plastic into their products. Um, this can largely at least reduce the amount of plastics that you're being exposed to, specifically through your produce and your meat. The reality is, is that almost everything you find in a supermarket has been processed and shipped and packaged in plastic. And so one of the only ways to avoid this reality is to just simply find local people that are making food, that are producing produce and meat, and just simply buy it from them and cook your own food. Now, the second way to um, at least minimize your intake of microplastic, which I'm a huge fan of, is to simply drink exclusively either one, a local spring source, or to a uh, reverse osmosis water. Now, um, it is really difficult for a lot of people to find a local source, a spring that is local that you can actually collect water from. And so this is obviously the best option that you might have to collect water that's coming out from the earth um, and that has been uncontaminated by any sort of microplastic. However, if you can't do that, reverse osmosis is a good second choice. Now, this may not completely completely eliminate the risk of micro, especially nanoplastics, because the reverse osmosis system may not completely eliminate nano, uh, nanoplastics. And there's actually a risk of uh, the reverse osmosis filter actually leaching uh, plastic into the finished water product. Um, however, with all things considered, when at least when compared to other water sources, um, uh, reverse osmosis does appear to be one of the best methods uh, to to at least um, uh, reduce the amount of plastic that you're consuming through your water. Now, the third method uh, may take a little bit longer to implement into your life, but that's just to simply completely eliminate all plastic from your life. Now, again, this is probably very impractical um, for a lot of people. However, doing your best to stop buying plastic uh, consumable goods will do two things. One, it will uh, limit your exposure in your own home, um, but two, it will limit the amount of plastic that's being uh, put back into the environment that has the potential to get into the food supply. Now, these would include things like plastic clothing and furniture made from polyester and nylon, kitchenware that's made from plastic, to-go cups um, are lined with plastic, uh, plastic packaging, cosmetics, toys, bedding, pillows, rugs, figuring out how to replace all of these items with non-plastic goods is uh, going to do two things. It's going to reduce your immediate exposure to plastics in your own home, but it's also going to reduce the amount of plastic that's being put into the environment that then your grandkids kids are going to have to deal with. And so I'm not usually a huge environment guy. However, in this specific instance where the interests of human health and the environment uh, coalesce and intersect, I am a huge proponent of taking somewhat extreme measures to protect your own health, but also protect the health of generations to come. Now, I'll, I know a lot of my detractors are going to be saying something along the lines of how the heck do you expect everyone to implement all of this? And the reality 
reality is, is I don't. Um, I don't expect anything from anyone. However, I do think we have a responsibility to at least move in the right direction. And so uh, I hope you, d you guys did find this video to at least be a little bit helpful and not completely depressing. Uh, but it's pretty much all I have for this video. So uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to leave a comment down below if they don't get uh, disabled on this video, uh, as well as a link to a complete at-home uh, hormone panel where you can see uh, how much microplastics have been affecting your hormones as well as to, to some other links to a lot of cool other products. But other than that, I will see you guys next time.